If you look at a blank CD-R, odds are you'll find these two numbers, 80 minutes of audio and 700 megabytes of data. You may be surprised to learn that these two numbers don't match. See, let's take the 80-minute figure. We know that the compact disc digital audio standard consists of two 16-bit streams, two because it's stereo audio, each consisting of 44,100 samples per second. Let's make it a bit easier and say that it's one stream of 8-bit words, or bytes. So by doubling 44,100 twice, once for stereo, once again to turn 16 bits into 8, we find that it's 176,400 bytes per second. Multiply that figure by 60 for 60 seconds per minute, and again by 80 for our 80-minute runtime, and you get 846,720,000 bytes. It would seem that an audio CD holds over 146 more megabytes than a data CD. What gives? We interrupt this program for a marginally important message. In the computing world, there is an unfortunate mixing of the terms megabyte and mebabyte. You'll almost never hear someone say mebabyte because it's a silly word, but the 700 on this disk is actually referencing mebabytes. What's the difference? A megabyte is 1 million bytes, based on powers of 10. A mebabyte is based on powers of 2, so it is actually 2 to the 20th bytes. So a kibabyte is 1,024 bytes, rather than 1,000, and a mebabyte is 1,024 kibabytes. This annoying debacle has been causing problems forever. For example, hard drive manufacturers quote sizes in gigabytes or terabytes when your PC works in terms of gigabytes and tebabytes. So this 2 terabyte portable drive only appears as 1.81 terabytes on my PC. But my PC is actually misrepresenting this figure as terabytes when it is in fact tebabytes. But CDs and DVDs are quoted in mebabytes and gibabytes, so even though this label shows MB instead of the correct M lowercase IB, my computer does the same mislabeling, and since they're both wrong, they agree. Anyway, all of this is to say, I'll be using the word megabyte even though sometimes it's actually a mebabyte. Please send complaints to YouTube Department of Pedantry, 19 Relentless Drive, Las Quejas, California. It would seem that an audio CD holds over 146 more megabytes than a data CD. What gives? Well, it's actually more of a what takes away, as the CD-ROM standard sacrifices those bytes for more precise error correction. As discussed in the channel's first video on the compact disc, the CERC error correction used in the compact disc digital audio standard can perfectly correct errors up to 3,500 bits long but it can also mask errors up to 12,000 bits long through interpolation. That means that it's essentially guessing what the audio samples should be for errors between 3,500 bits and 12,000 bits. Now for audio samples, that's fine. 12,000 bits is less than 1 100th of a second of audio. So even though the error correction might be fudging things, you'll almost certainly not notice it. But for data, that's not going to do it. Data cannot be fudged without serious consequences. In order for the compact disk to store data files reliably, it would either need to sacrifice durability or come up with a new error correction scheme. And it did neither, but also yes. CD-ROMs, or would that be CDs rom use the same CERC error correction and basic data structure of the CD audio disk, including the frame structure subcode and all that. But more error correction was added within the frame, which we've now formally decided to call a sector. Of the 2,352 bytes available in a sector on an audio CD, 304 get sacrificed, mostly for error correction, but also for some basic signaling such as synchronization and distinguishing between mode 1 and mode 2. Combined with an additional layer of CERC error correction, the CD-ROM standard maintained the same durability with zero tolerance error correction. We'll get to Mode 2 later, but nearly all CD data applications use Mode 1 for its complete error correction. Now that the compact disk was being used for more than a simple linear stream of audio, a true file system needed to be standardized. Initially things were rather ad hoc, but a group of 12 computer hardware manufacturers met at what was then the High Sierra Hotel and Casino in Lake Tahoe, California, where they settled on a standard called the High Sierra format. Eventually, this would become ISO 9660, the standard used to this day. However, it has been extended and improved over the years. Now that the CD-ROM was officially a thing, whole new multimedia experiences could be created. With the ability to store images, program files, sounds, and even video, the possibilities with CD-ROM were seemingly limitless. 
no longer bound by the 1.44 megabytes of a 3.5 inch floppy, elaborate games with full on soundtracks, thousands of color images, and more complicated structure could be produced. My greatest nostalgia factor comes from mid 90s educational games like the Magic School Bus games or my personal favorite, Jumpstart Third Grade. Seriously, this was a wicked awesome game and it's holding up pretty well, I'd say. In another day, the world will see the dawning of Polly Planet. Whoop! It seemed there's someone at the door. Let's take a little peek. Anyway, of course home computers weren't the only beneficiaries of this sort of vast data store. Video game consoles soon appeared which could take advantage of it. In fact, one of the earliest was the Philips CDI system. It technically wasn't using CD-ROMs though, as CDI discs were in fact their very own category, published in the Green Book. But unless you're either very young or were living under a rock through the 1990s and early 2000s, I'm sure you already knew what CD-ROMs could do. But the um in that CD-ROM, man that's a bummer. Sure, having 700 megabytes at your disposal is fantastic, but no one has a CD manufacturing and duplication facility just at home. But wait, they do! The development of the CD-R for Compact Disc Recordable meant that no longer would you be forced to write up a contract with a commercial CD pressing facility for at least 10,000 discs just to make a mixtape. Instead, all you needed was a $35,000 machine and a computer. It would take until the mid to late 90s for CD burners to come down in price, and even then there were annoyances, but now we're really talking. A CD-R, which incidentally is a pirate's favorite kind of CD, is constructed much the same as a normal CD, but with two important changes. First, the pits and lands molded into the polycarbonate layer are replaced with a continuous spiral pre-groove. This spiral will guide the laser of a drive writing to a disc, and it also contains the A-tip, which tells the drive the properties of the disc, such as its maximum write speed. Right on top of the pre-groove is a thin layer of an organic dye. That's why CD-Rs are sometimes a strange color or even just a little bit off from the normal silver. Then on top of the die, a partially transparent thin layer of metal, usually aluminum, is placed. This allows the laser light to be reflected back while still being influenced by the die. To burn data on the disc, the laser switches from its everyday gentle glow to an all-out light cannon of fire laser, and the high intensity heats up the die so much that its optical properties change. That's right, CD burners are literally burning the equivalent of pits onto the disc. Once it's been written, almost any CD drive going back to the earliest CD players can read these discs. The parts of the die that were made into a pit by the writing laser will dim the reading laser's reflection, which is much the same as how real pits cause destructive interference. So long as the CD reader can tell the difference between a burned spot and an untouched spot, it will read the data just fine. Being able to store data files onto a compact disc at home meant that just one of these guys could replace hundreds of floppy disks. But now we had a new problem. Remember how in a normal CD there are three parts, the lead in, program area, and lead out? Well, if we stuck to this limitation for the CD-R, then if you were to write as little as a Word document on a blank CD, you'll have written the lead out, and now the disk is done. The Orange Book introduced the standard of multi-session writing. Now, after the lead out of the disk, another lead in can be made. Each time a new session is made, the lead in is updated to include the location of all the files. On a multi-session disk, the drive will look for all the lead ins and once it finds the last one, it basically just ignores the rest. This is also how a file can be deleted from a CDR, as the latest lead in may simply not include it in the table of contents. But the data is still physically there and there are ways of getting to it. Of course, the central limitation to the CDR is that it is a write once, read many format. In fact, its original name was going to be CD Write Once, which I really wish had been stuck with because we could have called them CD Woes. Whoa! But we wouldn't be stuck with write only for long. Interestingly, the Orange Book detailed a rewritable CD based on magneto optical technology in 1990, the technology behind the mini disc. This never made it to commercial production, but the CD Mo would have been the perfect companion to the CD Wo. Instead, we got the CDRW in 1997. This is functionally identical to a CDR, but the organic dye layer is replaced with a silver indium antinomy tellurium alloy, also called by at least one person a Ginspati. This alloy has a unique property which alters its reflectivity based upon phase changes. In an unburned disc, the alloy is in a polycrystalline structure. 
But when the laser heats it to somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 to 700 degrees C, it melts it. And when it solidifies, it no longer has the same crystalline structure, and thus it reflects light about 15 to 25 percent less intensely than the crystalline parts. So spots that are melted by the laser turn into sort of pits, and spots that aren't remain sort of lands. What allows the disk to be rewritten is that when the alloy is heated to around 200 degrees Celsius, it doesn't melt, but any parts that have lost their polycrystalline structure will actually reform. This effectively erases all of the burned pits, and allows the disk to be written again. CDRWs have several severe limitations, though. Unlike a CDR, these disks generally cannot be read in standard drives. Because the change in reflectivity between a pit and a land is so slight, a CD reader needs to be much more sensitive to pick up the data. After the introduction of the CDRW, many standard CD readers were made more sensitive to accommodate them, sometimes branded as multi-read but it certainly wasn't universal. Another big problem of the CDRW was that the disks weren't always backwards compatible. Because of that phase-changing alloy, there is actually a minimum speed to write the disk. This basic 1-4x to disk will work in pretty much any drive so long as you can force it to burn slowly, but later higher speed disks might need a minimum speed of 8x or more, so if you only had a 4x drive, you're SOL. And before we put the CD to rest, let's look at some of the other stuff that those crafty engineers at Sony and Philips jammed into here. Remember the subcode channels R through W? Eventually, these would get used. CD plus G for CD graphics was used in karaoke machines. The first CD plus G discs were released in 1985. This was further refined into the CD plus EG, standing for extended graphics. In what seems backwards, it would take 11 years for Sony to introduce the CD text format in 1996. Also using the R through W subcode channels, this was essentially a way to add metadata such as track titles, artists, album, and all that jazz. Oddly, I can't find references to it being used for lyrics, which seems a wasted opportunity as there definitely is room. Remember the Mode 2 in CD-ROM I talked about earlier? That's right, I'm putting it in the same video this time. CD-ROM Mode 2 sacrificed some of the error correction of Mode 1 for a larger data capacity, about 800 megabytes. You wouldn't want a computer program or document stored in Mode 2, but for things like video files or large collections of images where a small error will simply result in a glitch or artifact, it was okay to use. Video CDs defined in the white book used Mode 2, and now that I know that, VCDs make a lot more sense to me. The video compression of VCD is ridiculous, but knowing that it's actually playing with 800 megabytes makes it seem a little less crazy. And there were other odds and ends. The delightful beige book defined a standard for photo CDs in 1992. The standard was a little ahead of its time though, as in 1992 CD-ROM drives really weren't that common yet, and it also stored photos in a proprietary format. Kodak developed the photo CD in a time when digital cameras weren't really a thing at all for consumers, so in a sense it was a very clever product. Get your film developed and receive a disc with very high resolution scans for future use. But by the time CD-ROM drives became widespread, digital cameras were starting to appear. And once CD burners came down in price, well, you could just burn JPEGs onto a CD, which you might recall many DVD players can show as a slideshow on your TV. You look back at Kodak's history, and you just can't help but feel sorry for them. And to round out the rainbow, the Blue Book of 1995 defined the Enhanced CD, which functioned both as an audio CD and a CD-ROM, with two sessions on a stamped disc. This was kind of neat, as a CD player would treat it as a normal audio CD, but you could store photos or interactive material in the data portion which a computer could access. The Scarlet Book of 1999 defined the standards of the Super Audio CD, a high-res audio format which is pretty much just a DVD but with audio only. It also had significantly different audio encoding, which I won't go into right now, and multi-channel support. And the last of the Rainbow Books was the Purple Book of 2000, which if you thought the Super Audio CD was obscure, well you haven't read the Purple Book. All this was was a reduction in pit size and narrower spacing to double the data capacity of a CD. And it was only for use as data storage, not audio. But when DVDs already existed, what was the point? That's pretty much what everyone asked, and it was practically dead on arrival. But an interesting thing about the Purple Book. In a way, it had been implemented, although much more subtly, long before it was published. 
See, the original compact disc standard was 74 minutes or 650 megabytes of data. But the vast majority of CDRs and CDRWs you can buy are 80 minutes, 700 megabytes. It was discovered not long into the life of the CD that the tolerances were generous enough to space the tracks just a little bit tighter together without violating the red book specs. The purple book just did that to a much more radical extent, but many years too late. And finally, one thing you should know about pretty much all writable optical media. The dyes and alloys aren't terribly stable. Many of the earliest CDRs are failing, as the die is degrading or the disc is delaminating. If you have any precious data stored on optical media, you might want to back that up pretty soon. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. This just about wraps up the saga on the compact disc. I think I had all the bases, but I certainly didn't go into detail on everything. If there's something more specific you'd like me to look into, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. As always, thank you to everyone who supports this channel on Patreon. I say this every time, but seriously, thank you. Your support makes this channel possible and you are awesome for it. If you would like to join the Patreon crew to support the channel, as well as get perks like early video access, some occasional behind the scenes stuff, and the inside scoop on the latest projects, please check out my Patreon page. Thanks for your consideration, and I'll see you next time. So long as the CD reader can tell the difference between a burned spot and an untouched spot, it will read the data just fine. I need to record that line because I screwed it up. The development of the CDR for Compact Disc Recordable meant that no longer... Wait. No, that was right. <clears throat> Let's try again. ...is replaced with a silver indium antimony... Antimony, right? It's antimony? Yeah. Antimony Cricket. And it also stored photos in a proprietary format Kodak developed. Ah! It technically wasn't using CD-ROMs, though as CDI discs were in fact their very own category, published in the green book.